I first took my daughter, she was two years old, to a pond and got her this little fishing pole, it was pink, and you push a button and the line drops down and it had a bobber on it. And she was enthralled and she wanted to spend all day putting that thing in the water and then she caught a fish. And she saw this fish and was like, oh, it was amazing. And, and she just loves fishing. It's like, where, what is that? Fishing for pelagic species can be considered comparable to big game hunting. You're going after fishes that can weigh upwards of 2,000 pounds. And it's a very much team-oriented sport. It's not something, generally speaking, that an angler goes out and catches one of these fish by themselves. It takes a dedicated captain, a really capable crew, um, to put things in, in motion that, to take advantage of whatever opportunities come your way. Those early days, people went out in hand-propelled boats, you know, row boats or even small sailboats, and pitted themselves against big fish like Pacific uh, bluefin tuna, striped marlin and blue marlin fish like that, using very, very primitive tackle, and this goes back, you know, 50, 60, 80 years. There's something about the power of the, those fish. When it slams down on an 80 wide and it's just smoking line, you're just, it's unbelievable. And I remember so distinctly, the first jump was away from the boat and the sun glistening on that back that's so wide and so beautiful blue. And when they're fired up, there's a blue ridge that runs down both sides of the fin. And the way the light hit that as he was going away was just, you know, I, I will never forget that, ever. You might be committed for a couple hours, maybe more, you know, maybe several hours, maybe five, six hours on a fish. It depends on how the fish wants to be. It's just the angler and the beast until it's over one way or another. Fuel capacity is 2,800 gallons. Uh, we have Caterpillar motors, diesel motors in it. They are 1,925 horsepower a piece. We cruise it like 29 to 30 knots. Uh, at that speed, I'm burning uh, about 125 gallons an hour. Of course, GPSs now are part of our uh, system. We have sonar that helps you look for fish. Uh, night vision is put on here. You got $1,600, $1,700 in a reel. The fighting chair down there, that's what we use to catch big fish out of, is about eight or $9,000 but it's worth every penny of it. Who 
<laughs> that ain't me, babe. This is a whole different world than the rusty old spinner and leaky skiff my stepdad used to keep on the Santa Monica Bay. Where I used to fly fish behind the ore house where I was singing, and there was a plaque that I would see behind one of my favorite holes, and it was where Ernest Hemingway had had his last moment. Life ain't easy. And then I end up through music again down here in the Florida Keys, and everybody's Hemingwaying and all that. Then I ended up going from being a trout guide to being a blue marlin fisherman. And then as that would go full circle, I end up in Pamplona <laughs> running with the bulls, you know, and by his statue. Yeah. Truth is, I've read about this stuff in books. I never dreamed I'd actually get the chance to do it myself. Are you nervous? Yeah, I'm nervous. I'd be nervous. Yeah, but, you know, I've never done this before, so. What are you gonna catch? Well, they say this is not the marlin season, so uh, they, they say dolphin fish, probably, uh, some mahi mahi, maybe some wahoo. So we'll see. Well, whatever you catch, just make sure it's really big. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I see the seas are kind of rough right now, so. Did you take your bone? Yeah, I took one last night and I took one this morning. I should be okay. We'll see. Did you have a big plate of fried eggs this morning? Oh, I did. I made sure they were over easy and runny. <laughs> I don't need to hunt for my food. I can go to the supermarket and gather it. It's not about food. It's about hunting. Good morning, Captain. Good morning, sir. Permission to come aboard. Absolutely. Right on. We're just going to head out and start trolling around looking for birds, looking for any kind of debris. And we'll kind of target around those. Those are where the fish should be. If there's birds, there's bait. Usually if there's bait, there's fish. What's the wind like today? We're calling for 15 to 20, but I looked this morning on NOAA's website, it was reporting sustained at 13, gusts to 14. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad. Look into the sky and see him, how bad an ass kicking you're gonna take from the wind. You're offshore, there's nowhere to hide. You can't get behind a bluff when you're in 6,000 feet of water. And here's your handle, that's how you wanna handle it. Crank a little bit. Blue and whites, which look kind of more like a bait fish. Um, this could kind of look a little bit more like a tuna. The, the pink, they say, is kind of a squid color. And with these, these are called sea witches. Feathers back this way. So this is the direction of travel. And that big billowy, just nylon fiber around the bait gives the bait a much larger silhouette easier for the fish to see. What is this? Uh, this is what we're going to use in place of a traditional fighting belt. This just gets placed on the butt of the rod and just slips right down inside. Then you can place this anywhere around your hip or waist that you need to feel comfortable to fight the fish. With fighting belts, if it doesn't fit just right, if it slides around either side, people wind up kind of fighting the belt more than they wind up fighting the fish. Okay.
So you're where the real ocean begins. You get that sense of adventure that you don't get standing maybe streamside. Captain is up in the tuna tower, scanning the horizon for signs of fish. The mate is preparing the lines, setting them in the outriggers. Then, we wait. People always ask me, new deckhands, what do I need to know about marlin fishing? I said, can you do this? For a long time, <laughs> just sit and stare and watch the baits. I have spent weeks on end in the tower, staring back at the spread, waiting for that second. Once you've seen that first giant fish show up and that dark spot starts moving behind a bait and comes in and crashes, and it's just, it's a rush like no other. Left rigger! Turn a little bit to the right, Cap! Requires a technique to where you're not ever grinding against it, it's you're using to, to lift the rod and the line at the same time and crank just to slide the rod down the line and then stop. Just a couple of cranks. Now you're back there again. You can ease it on up and you're just sliding the rod down just enough to keep the rod bowed and slide it down. Sometimes you'll get it six inches at a time. All my focus is on keeping tension on the line. I let it loose when the fish sounds and reel in when there is slack, feeling for the turn Letting go again when whatever was on the end of this line went down, deep into the dark waters. And then a quick sense of relief, feeling the slack in the line as it turns to come back up. And reeling like mad to regain the lost line. And then I see her. She sails clear out of the water. She's so beautiful, I, I nearly dropped the rod overboard forgetting we are connected. And she re-enters the water and goes down, it's so much deeper than before, and she's pulling with all her might. I can feel her down there. I try to imagine what it's like for her with the surrounding darkness closing in. I can feel it closing in on me as well. The boat is pitching violently under my feet. My head is swimming. Breathe, I hear the captain shout. You know, first it's like, they, they're, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get you, and then they get real tired and say, I hate this fish, and then, you know, they just want nothing but to get them, and then at the end, there's just, it's almost like a love between them, you know, they've been through a moment. She turns again, coming back up. Slower this time, I notice. She surfaces and I can see she is tired. And then she turns towards the boat and comes to me. There is always that one final roll or that one final lunge where the fish will come up sideways for you and you realize it's done.
it's just that one point where their eye starts looking back down, wanting to go back down in the water, you know, and they're laying on their side, let me back down in there. And, uh, and that's the point where I always have the fellow that just spent an epic endeavor with this fish come over and just touch that fish, make that final connection. I went to the store the other day to get some seafood for dinner. I wanted to find a fish I felt good about eating. I was curious where the fish was from. That information was a little harder to find than I expected. It's not here. Here it is. India. Huh. We import about 85% of our seafood from overseas. Big stores that sell seafood have to give the consumer two pieces of information. One, which country the, the seafood came from, and two, whether the fish was farmed or wild caught. Unfortunately, it doesn't apply to all parts of the seafood industry. Restaurants aren't required to do it. Small fish markets aren't required to do it. For any seafood that's been canned or, or smoked or processed or altered in any kind of way, that automatically makes them exempt from this labeling law. There's over 1,700 species of fish that are commercially available in the United States, and it's very difficult for the end user to know exactly what they're getting when so many species are very similar. If you put like a white piece of snapper beside a white piece of tilapia or grouper or tilefish, uh, most people are not going to be able to discern between the two. Apparently, even if you find seafood that's labeled, it's often mislabeled. Seafood fraud. That's scary. Oceana found that one third of the samples, over 1,200 of which we collected, were mislabeled across the country. The most commonly mislabeled types of fish in our study were snapper, 87% of those were something else, and tuna, where 59% were something else as well. That's it. I can't handle this. I'm going to catch my own fish. At least I'll know what I'm eating. I'm not quite sure where to start, but I definitely need a fishing pole, and a hook, and some line. Um, I need to find out what fish are in season and where to find them, and I think a fishing license. Hey. Ready for the casting lesson? Yes. The line is being held by the bale, and so what you want to do in order to cast is take your index finger, you're going to pull that line up, and then you're going to take this hand and you're going to flip the bale open. Give it a shot. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, reel, reel it in. <laughs> Where's that? Flip the bale. Or, oh. There you go. Okay, you want to reel a bit more in. Whoa. Okay. Okay. So you want to reel. Uh, here. Now you want to flip the bale. Flip the bale. Yeah. Back. Nice. Uh. Well, you know. <laughs> it takes a bit of practice. So you have to remember that 11 o'clock. Yeah. Um, release. To let your it's a release. Yeah. So if you notice, some of the people down here are putting bait on their hook. Oh, I got a strike. Oh. Um. There's fish out here. Yeah. And so what they'll do is they'll cast out here and they'll let the bait sit on the bottom and they sort of wait for the fish to come to the bait mm. based on their sense of smell. 
But this time of day, even the, the fish that are associated with the mangroves might start moving away onto the seagrass to feed. Mm. Um, it's very species dependent. But, um, uh. Oh, it's there. It kind of went way <laughs> up and went way down. <laughs> There's a lot more to catching your own fish than I realized. Mangrove snapper, what do you recommend? Okay, great choice. Start off with some frozen shrimp. Okay. Uh, that's kind of candy to the mangrove snapper, so that's always a really good choice. We can also use some frozen squid, mm -hmm. which is really hardy, stays on the hook very well. Okay. And your last choice that I would probably use would be a piece of alley hood like this. It's a local bait fish. You cut it into chunks about that size, and that's another great way to catch them. Okay, so cool. all three of those will work for you today. Awesome. It says product of the USA, wild caught in the Pacific Ocean. I guess in this zone, FAO 77. But then it's processed in China, and it's packaged for this company in New Jersey, and now it's here in Florida. That's a lot of effort to catch and process and transport this fish, just to use as bait. Maybe I should just have this for dinner. Biggest thing is like line management too. Like every once in a while, if your jig spins around the top of your rod, sometimes it'll get twisted around. Just knowing that the the line's caught up. And... Well, I've always liked fishing. I guess my father liked fishing. I've been fishing ever since I was a little kid. It's just fun to catch your own fish. You know, it's might be a somewhat of a testosterone thing too. Right. You feel like you're feeding yourself, you know. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, there's no oceans in Kentucky, and this is like an experience you get once you, a year. Once a year, you come out, you get on a boat like that. And... Thank you for coming out with us today on the Sailor's Choice. My name is Jamie. I'll be your first mate today. Guys, I like to go out here and have fun with everybody and go out here and catch some fish. I like to leave reality back at the dock. What do you guys say? All right. All right. We're bottom fishing. You just want to get it all the way down to the bottom. Give it a crank or so up and wait until you get a bite. And I'll demonstrate that here in just a minute. When you think you have a fish on, I need you to yell, fish on. It's very important that you do that. Nice and loud, so wherever I'm out on the boat, I can hear you, get over you, help you land your fish, make sure it's legal and edible, get it up into the box, so you guys can take home lunch or dinner. The bait on board was squid and mullet, both of which were previously frozen. But the captain also caught some live ballyhoo to use as bait. They're chumming the whole time too, throwing fish guts, oatmeal, who knows what, in the water behind the boat to attract fish. It kind of feels like cheating. Even though I wasn't targeting this fish, I caught it. This is called bycatch, and it happens in every fishery. And while hook and line is considered one of the best fishing methods for avoiding bycatch, you still catch things you don't want. When bycatch happens on a large scale, it can be a problem for marine ecosystems. So we're sure we can't eat this? I don't want it. You, don't you want could it. eat it. Good. You don't want it. I felt bad catching the barracuda. I hope it survived. Um, I typically only eat the fish that I catch when I do eat fish, just because I know what it is, when it was caught, 
how it was handled, whether it's been on ice the entire time, it was filleted that day or the next day. The first fish I ever caught would not lie down quiet in the pail, but flailed and sucked at the burning amazement of the air, and died in the slow pouring off of rainbows. Later, I opened his body and separated the flesh from the bones and ate him. Now the sea is in me. I am the fish. The fish glitters in me. We are risen, tangled together, certain to fall back to the sea. Out of pain and pain and more pain, we feed this feverish plot. We are nourished by the mystery. Recreational angling is enjoyed by so many people around the world. No. No. People love to fish. Yet their motivations can be quite diverse. Ugh. How do we measure the value of fishing? I grew up fishing, and fishing connected me to nature. It gave me something positive to focus on. We were out in the bay, and there was a fish tailing. He wasn't actually tailing, he was slithering. And I put a little snapping shrimp on a Chico Fernandez's special snapping shrimp right out in front of him, and stripped it a few times and his dorsal fin clicked a couple times and came tight on him. And we put him in a live well and brought him back and weighed him and he was 12-1. Wow. It was great. We got right back in the boat, went to the exact same spot and caught one that was 12-2 on the next <laughs> cast. <laughs> same fly? Same fly. <laughs> the bonefish are, um, they're just remarkable. The, they're a creature of habit and the way they feed and the way they move in the water as a predator, a, you know, perceive themselves as a predator and tail and mud and everything, they're hard to see. Um, they're not forgiving. You have to do everything right and they're just a, a challenge to get the bite. Any good tips for me? Oh, wow. 
Uh, I think your first shot's going to be your best shot. <laughs> and it might be your last shot. <laughs> I like to present a fly on what I perceive to be the outside edge of the fish's awareness. So that this fish is going along and he's looking at the bottom and he's looking around, he's also worried, looking over his shoulder. I like him to think something happened over here. Not a splash or whatever, but just something. I like to fly to land so that it's that. Sometimes I, I fish an old reel like a hardy uh, lightweight, and this particular reel has a clicker drag that Hardy have had for years. The patent, the patent on it is 1888, so it's been it's been over a hundred years. And one of the interesting things about that is that when you look at it, there is the clicker. That's all it is, and this is a spare clicker and spring uh, in case you need it one day, and that's it. This one I got in 1960. This reel, I've caught 50 pound tarpon, I've caught 20 pound snook, a million bonefish. I use it in the Bahamas, I use it for redfish. It's just fun to do, it's, it's, it's not my main reel. I have a lot of um, wonderful, light, state-of-the-art reels and I enjoy them. But it's fun to do this and it, and it brings me back or keeps me uh, uh, tuned to the basic, which is that Fly fishing only needs so much, and we keep embellishing and embroidering it, and, and you know, you can do it with very little. Can you show me some of your flies? You tied some pretty famous bonefish flies. Uh, right? Yes, I did. In 1968, I tied that fly for the first time. It has monofilament wrapped over mylar. Actually, I started by tying it at 15 or, or 10, 12 turn nail knot on the bottom, and it made a very translucent fly, and that was good with polar bear hair, but then I put mylar underneath, and I think I'm the first one to do that. I still use it, you know what, and it still works well, but I use it on very shallow water where I need the fly not to drop. Is it is it about yeah. catching a fish, no. or is it about getting away from <clears throat> your job? Like the, the, the first five minutes that I was out on the flats, decompressed the six months worth of craziness in my normal life. enjoy the ride. Cruising channels, going over flats, going over basins that are five, six feet, getting to another flat we have to go across and it's only four inches and we can't get across but we find a tiny little channel and we zigzag right by a key and the ride is wonderful and I enjoy that. Like a walk in the woods, you see the woods different than if you ran a motorcycle and the noise and all that. It, it, insanely different. There's no engine running. You're pushing the boat with a stick, for crying out loud. Today, some of the guys are pushing with a $1,500 graphite super duper Krypton pole. <laughs> But it's still a stick. It still doesn't do anything like the fly rod. You still have to push the boat by hand. And in doing that, you see the fly in a different way. What I like so much about the flat also is that there's not a spot. It isn't like, okay, here we're on top of a, of a wreck and it's right down there, they're big amber jacket. No, no, this is a movable feast. The spot that was so hot and you caught two bonefish early in the morning is now four inches out of water, okay? He's pushing you in a direction 
that has to do partly with your visibility, but mostly with meeting the fish head on. So you're seeing fish coming in, you're seeing life coming in. You look for signs of them feeding. They, they, they kick up a dust plume under, underwater when, they, when they're digging in the grass for shrimp or crabs or toadfish. Or, and um, and when, when they do that, they kick up, we call it a mud. So you look for muds. It's probably one of the easiest ways to spot bonefish. So you look for nervousness in the water. You look for tailing fish. You look for the fish in general just moving. But when I'm out on the flats, and I see bonefish and I'm looking for the wake. It's like I'm tracking, you know, a, something through the snow or something. I mean, are you trying um, to kill it? No, I'm trying right. to catch it. Historically, anglers used to keep bonefish and bring them back to the dock for show. But that practice has changed. Bonefish are a catch and release species. But it's more than that. It's also a matter of how bonefish are handled. They can't uh, be removed from the water except for pictures they have to be released to the site of capture. So there's no more of that dropping a bonefish into the boat and having it bounce around. Basically what we tell people, if it's not in the water for the picture, if it's got to still be dripping. The best photo of the bonefish is the first few seconds when he comes up and the fins are tight and he, once he droops, it's no good for him, the photo, you, anybody. You see a bonefish and he's tailing along and you, you're able to take a fly and put it in a position and make him think he's a predator and getting ready to attack it and he runs over and you set the hook and finds out that you're the predator, not him. <laughs> so. You know, fly fishing is so basic. I think of it like bow and arrow hunting where there's no button, el botón, how we say in Spanish, there, there's no push button entertainment, there's no instant gratification. You need to learn how to make the cast. With bow and arrow, you need to learn to throw an arrow, to shoot an arrow. With fly fishing, it's the same. You need to become a, a caster. You can buy that cast. You can go around the world, if you have the money, go all the way to the best bonefish flat, but the last 50 feet, you gotta make yourself. You want to get the fly in front of him without him knowing how it got there. So you want a, a nice, delicate presentation, getting the fly down, landing softly. And then you want to be stripping that fly away on the right angle. The fly's not moving towards the fish, but moving away to, to look like an escaping bait. So the fish will definitely, you know, set up and prey on it. You can't live for the moment of the strike alone. It's the whole day. The places are beautiful, whether you bone fish in the Florida Keys or the Bahamas, or whether you fish northern Spain for salmon or for big brown trout, and later you have a fabada soup, and the whole thing, it, it, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. It's me, I mean, I belong in that world. By the end of the day, I'm simply content with just being out there, enjoying the flats. Most of me doesn't really care if I've caught a bonefish. Sometimes you go bonefishing and you don't catch anything and you've had a good time. Why? Because you fly fish for bonefish. You went fly fishing for bonefish. You knew enough to know that the guy had you at the right depth, the turtle grass was flattened down with the tide, you saw a few stingrays, you saw a few fish, 
looked like bonefish. You saw one fish tail. You were, you were in bonefish world. You were hunting in the, in the bonefish world. That sometimes is enough, good enough for comfort. When I was seven, I found a clam in shallow water. I gave it to a man, and he left it in the bottom of the boat to dry. I saw it move, and knew for the first time that it was alive. I cried until he threw it back. When I was ten, I saw the coral reef. More color than I had thought possible. Walls of rock reaching up to me. Sea fans waving to me in the current. And barracuda hanging in space. Everywhere, secret fish living secret lives. When I was 22, I crossed the Atlantic in a sailboat. That experience led me to become an engineer. We have a barrier reef system along the Florida Keys, and it runs the length of the Florida Keys from just south of Miami, Florida, all the way out past the Dry Tortugas. It's been referred to as the third longest barrier reef system in the world. And it's also the basis for a lot of the marine life in our coastal waters. So uh, the grouper and snapper fishery that we rely on uh, is, is related to that coral reef system, as is everything else. They've been called the rainforests of the sea, and they really are that. I went out there on a really rough day, and I remember everybody on the boat was sick except me, and I didn't want to come in. <laughs> no, I don't want to. I want to stay. But it was awesome. And there's, you know, all the inshore, offshore channels. Just, it, it was great. I started diving here in 1969, and I was a little kid, and it was, it was really nice. There was coral everywhere, the Elkhorn coral. You couldn't even, you couldn't even swim over it. You couldn't see past it, and it was just awesome. Coral is a story contained within my lifetime. The reefs that were stunning when I was a child may be in the history books when I die. It's going so fast that we almost don't see it going. And then uh, I just watched it die bit by bit by bit and it was, it was really frustrating. And now I go out there and you know people still go out and it's still pretty and there's still some nice reefs but it's, it's just a shadow of what it used to be. It's a reef with coral instead of a coral reef. You know, there's a, there's a difference. Corals particularly are declining very rapidly. Corals have a complex life cycle where they have little teeny plankton for the first part of their life, for the first week or two, and then they settle down on the bottom and become the polyps and the, the colonies that we see on the reef and they're microscopic polyps, and so the ocean is still a pretty dangerous place for something that small. Here in the Keys, it was, a real turning point was 1977. It snowed here in the Keys, so that, that thermal shock just really did a number on the Elkhorn and Staghorn corals. 1983, the sea urchins died. You know, we, we hated those sea urchins. They were everywhere, and it was a plague and yet they were so important to the ecology of the Keys and to the ecology of the reefs throughout the Caribbean. They kind of act like lawnmowers. They keep the reef clean, the reef substrate. And that's super important, particularly for the recruitment of baby corals. When they died, it was uh, catastrophic. And they all died literally in the matter of weeks to months, you know, in 1982-83. Um, the reefs sort of within a couple months became overgrown with seaweeds. And then 1998 was this uh, kind of a global bleaching event. And so all these great big coral heads, they all bleached and a lot of them died. The root causes of disease are still poorly understood. Maybe corals have some sort of chronic infection. The organism is okay most of the time, but as soon as you have some sort of assault by temperature, a chemical, uh, another pathogen, um, it's, it's all over. If it's, you know, some particular po chemical pollutant or, you know, one of these, uh, some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals, if it's something specific like that that we could fix relatively easily, it's very difficult to determine that. And that's really where the science is sort of floundering. The system is so badly broken 
that unless we get in and do it, we're not going to have a coral reef. We certainly have a number of threats that we need to be concerned about. We have overfishing, we have climate change, we have pollution. Um, but when, we, when you throw lionfish into that mix, it may be uh, trumping many of those highly regarded threats. They're gluttonous feeders, and they feed on a very wide variety of prey items. They eat commercially valuable species, they eat ecologically important species. All indications are this is going to be a very severe threat to our native marine life. The first records we know of, of lionfish anywhere in the western Atlantic was off the southeast coast of Florida, 1985. People had them in their aquariums and they either outgrew the tanks and they set their fish free in the ocean thinking they were doing a good thing. But obviously, once those fish got together and began to reproduce, it wasn't just one or two fish anymore and we have now huge numbers of lionfish throughout the region. And you look back to my childhood, our childhood, and the reefs were much healthier than they are today. This is faster than global warming, it's faster than the loss of the rainforest, it's, it's faster than almost any other environmental crisis you can think of. You don't eat coral and it's not moving. We don't it's eat the not, rainforest. You don't see it every day. You don't you see know? it, that's the biggest Our thing. That it's... There's at least one thing that almost any of us can do if you're willing to get wet. Lionfish are native to the Indo-Pacific region. Something in that range keeps them in check. We don't know if it's a predator, parasite, competition, could be a, a combination of all those factors together. We are still seeing lionfish densities go up at some sites. Now we're also seeing lionfish densities decrease at some sites. And those are areas where divers and snorkelers are actively removing lionfish. The sea is no longer wild. I have touched it in so many ways. The fish I eat, the ships full of things that I buy, the acid from the CO2 my car puts in the air, the sewage pipes that end in the ocean. My presence here is inevitable. Its character is what matters. finding that we can have a very positive impact where we have organized regular removals.
These are the spines that are very uh, venomous. It's actually a very delicate fish, very nice and sweet. Now, once we cut all the, the fins, as you can see, now there's no more danger. And this is a way that by eating this fish, you can help the ecosystem. But the lionfish invasion spans such a broad geographic area and such a wide depth range from the surface of the ocean or the shoreline all the way down to a thousand feet. We are still seeing lionfish densities go up at some sites. We are not talking eradication of lionfish or even large scale control at this point. We can't catch them all. And suppose we could. Would that bring back the reef? What am I doing here? All the corals can die and we may still have a reef for a decade or two, but its days are numbered as soon as you don't have live coral on the reef as well as dead coral. We don't have new babies to replace the ones that are dying. Okay, so the corals that we're working with, just about any coral really can be cut into pieces and grown from fragments, fragmentation we call it. Staghorn and elkhorn coral in particular are branching corals. They grow really fast. And so we cut them into small pieces, they grow into bigger pieces. And you just keep doing that until you have a lot of them. And so we take them from the nursery, put them on the reef and glue them down with epoxy or sometimes we nail them down and put cable ties on it. We're close to about 10,000 corals now that we've put on the reef and we have a goal of 10,000 a year for the next several years. But that's not our end game. Our end game is to put ourselves out of business by getting the system working again. We're putting them back where they belong, where they used to be, and we're putting multiple genetic strains down. So when they get big enough to reproduce, they can start to cross fertilize and they can, you know, the corals can take over the job of spreading, you know, seeds around on the reef instead of us doing it. And obviously we want to get them doing it on their own. We can't do this forever. The stuff we're doing right now is going to buy us a lot of time. I have a confession to make. It wasn't my fish. I have yet to catch up with a lionfish. We look for that fish for days, and any day spent swimming around the coral is a pretty good day. But it's clear that saving the reef is going to take more than lionfish hunts. Everything we do on land ultimately has an impact on the ocean. It, it can't, we can't just keep doing business as usual and, and expect these systems to survive. They won't do it, and coral reefs will be one of the first ones to go. It seems to me, coral are the engineers of the reef. Tiny animals who build cities of stone under the water. So if they are in trouble, we may be in trouble too. You look at what happened here in the Keys in 1998, and you look at what happened in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico in 2005, and it is very clear these warm temperature events have, have caused more coral death than anything else. Um, and so the warming, carbon, global warming, problem is the one that we need to fix. If I do my part and other people do their part, then we might just have a coral reef, you know, that my grandchildren will see. The problem is, once you put those colonies back out on the reef, they act like the colonies on the reef, which means a lot of them still die over a period of years. It's sort of a thumb in the dike. We're going to have to keep putting them there until we can keep them from dying. The only fish that I really found in the sea was me. These coral nurseries feel like engineering underwater, building something. I like that. I definitely feel more connected to my food now. I don't think I'll be able to catch all the fish I eat, but I do want to buy wild American seafood that's caught in responsible ways. The next time I go fishing for my dinner, I'll probably try and catch something like a mahi-mahi. It's a fast grower and pretty abundant around here. South Florida has four or five million people now. So I think that the weight of humanity is, uh, is a problem with a lot of our environmental resources. I feel like they've been getting a little smaller. I remember the average size, I would always say seven, eight pounds, but now I'm saying more like five, six pounds. We need a healthier flat environment, not just healthier bonefish only, 
a healthier flat environment. So the, the little schoolmasters that are in the pothole are there. So the shrimp and the snapping shrimp and the mantises and all the other food is there. And the bar jack and the stingrays and the leopard rays and the sharks that come in. You need the whole neighborhood. When I'm not out here, I'm a professor teaching others about what I've learned in a lifetime of studying fish and how to protect them. As I move forward in life, I will continue my personal quest to secure the future of fish. What the fish have given me, I try to give back to them. Peace. In some stories, you get to write your own ending. I'd rather remember this beautiful, amazing fish alive. So I let her go. You're okay joking. today. I'm from New but, York. You came down here and but, you, you ruined some fish's day that was just swimming around out there. You know. But today, he doesn't remember it. But that fish made my day for life.